Uh, hopefully that you should be able to see me. Who am I? That's a good question. Uh, alrighty, let's get ready to rumble. Okay. Uh, so welcome uh, to Who Am I? John Practically Stevenson. Um, I think I'm the oldest member of the Startspom team, possibly one of the older members of the people who are at Startspom. I like to think that's a good thing. Okay, so let's try and figure out who I am. Um, so in the beginning, humans landed on the moon and I was conceived thanks to this wonderfully inspiring event. Um, at least that's what I was told. So I have to thank NASA for my existence. Um, luckily, I don't have any pictures of my conception, so you're quite safe. So you'll just have to uh, settle for pictures of people on the moon. Uh, I grew up in the largest uh, county in North Yorkshire, so uh, the largest, largest county in the UK, which is called North Yorkshire. Uh, although ironically living in lots of little tiny villages. As you can see, this is uh, West Tamfield, tiny little village. Um, in the middle of nowhere, but it was very beautiful. And uh, I've lived in four different uh, villages uh, as I was growing up. And I think I've lived in about 20 different places uh, in my life so far. So I do get around. Uh, one of those places was uh, RAF Leeming. And uh, uh, it was quite an adventure there. I lived there for a year and it occasionally was quite noisy with uh, with uh, lots of airplanes taking off, but sometimes I got to see some of the training flights as well, so that was quite good. Uh, but most of Yorkshire is absolutely beautiful and stunning and a little bit quieter than RAF Leeming, so that's quite nice. Um, I might be starting to uh, sound like the tourist board for North Yorkshire, but uh, it is beautiful uh, even when it's snowing as well. Uh, so I, I do kind of miss there and uh, I should go back there and do some more exploring. Um, I've had a very varied life, um, so I started work early, probably a lot earlier than is legal, and uh, started helping out my family's fruit and veg business and uh, at weekends and holidays. And uh, so I started off like selling like old fruit that nobody would want to buy. It's like for pennies, uh, I think, because I was a I was a cute child. That's what my parents said: just go and sell this crap that nobody else will buy. And uh, and then like stocking and writing the writing the little signs for the prices and so on. And I did that until I was about 16. Um, actually, this isn't a picture of my family. Although disturbingly, the hat and the shirt are exactly what my father used to wear and my grandfather. So I'm not sure if that's just a Yorkshire thing, but it could be. And the girl in this photo looks a little bit like my sister as well. So um, it's bizarre what you can find on the internet. And uh, because I lived in the countryside, then cycling was uh, a great way to get round. Uh, and I think in about a decade or so of riding, I only had one accident when a car decided to uh, carry straight on on a mini roundabout, uh, not no, not noticing I was there. But I only got a bruised leg, and um, so it didn't really stop me. And if I wanted to go buy records, then the nearest shop was 20 miles away to buy like decent records. Uh, so I soon got used to riding around uh, on uh, on bikes. Um, I did have some education, uh, good old English comprehensive. Uh, I think I was pretty good at sciences, but not much else. Um, but yeah, it was fun, I think. Um, but yeah, it's not much uh, to report about that, I don't think. Uh, and then I actually went to, uh, uh, started working for at Lightwater Valley, which is like this local little theme park, like Alton Towers, but a lot smaller. And uh, we got to work on little rides like this. This is, uh, this is a ride called The Rat and um, hopefully you can see the video and this is when it was going around with somebody with the lights on normally this is in pitch black and you just see the eyes of the rats going around you can see how close that roof is to the top that's really dangerous if people stood up they kind of get they'd bang their heads um, and when it was cold then uh, it was quite uh, it was quite scary because i actually had to climb up uh, this kind of structure which is about 20 30 feet in the air we're just on just on a simple ladder to push the cars back on to get going back on the track because when it was cold they wouldn't get enough speed up to go up the ramps and i was kind of quite scared doing that um i'm not sure if i already was afraid of heights but i was very wary of heights by the time i worked on this ride uh and it was uh it was quite scary and i'm, I'm quite surprised i actually survived the uh, event there was basically like three or four of us as well i would have to climb up 
uh, and uh, and push these carts off. So we basically had to hold on to the either the the rails at the side or the actual track itself. Um, but luckily, I survived and didn't die, so that's quite good. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be here doing this now. And uh, when I, after I finished at Lightwell Valley, I went to college for um, a couple of years and did an engineering course. That was a fun course. We got to build uh, things like go-karts. I ate lots of chips and mushy peas, which was very really nice because there's a chippy right next door. Um, but I did have to ride on a bus for three hours every day, which was not so good, but it gave me a chance to read some books. So that was quite nice. Uh, the advantage of living out in the middle of nowhere is that, that there isn't any public transport. Um, but uh, the, these buses were put on specifically to, uh, to take uh, college students to college. Uh, and in between college years, I was back at Lightwell Valley during the summer, and that was good fun. I got to work on different rides that were slightly less dangerous, uh, also I thought anyway. Uh, these skate carts were amazingly great fun. You had this big long skate uh, track which kind of had a gradual slope down to the bottom, and when the when the visitors were at the park, we used to go and ride around there as well and try and see if we could get a really big speed up. Have you ever seen kind of the, the lunge, uh, the luge racing uh, in winter sports? It's like this, but um, but in summer, uh, it was good fun. And I got to work on um, uh, this super looper ride, which is nice to be outside instead of the pokey little underground rat that I used to work on. Uh, and this rarely broke down, so that was quite nice. So we just had to uh, uh, make sure that all the uh, all the kids were strapped into the roller coaster ride properly before it set off. Uh, so it was a much nicer job. And then there was this uh, this go kart racing track, uh, which looked good fun, uh, but it was incredibly dangerous as well. Um, uh, one of the uh, one of the people that worked on here went to push off. Somebody had crashed against the side. And unfortunately, another child came tearing up behind him, didn't see him, and ran into the back of him. And unfortunately, the person working on there had his leg stuck in between the two, and the bone kind of popped out. Uh, that was a really awful kind of thing. Um, so uh, they had to put in a whole bunch of safety measures in there uh, to stop that happening again, and and actually train us how to deal with the kids properly without getting themselves killed. Uh, yeah, so another uh, interesting venture in the world of my life and not dying so that's good uh, so I survived that and went to Huddersfield University although it was called a polytechnic then um, and so I studied electronic engineering um, but mainly rock music and beer uh, mainly because uh, there was the highest ratio of pubs per population in in Huddersfield it is pretty much the center of the universe because in uh, the north of England, it's like it's in the centre of everything, so you can go to Manchester, Liverpool, kind of uh, lots of other really cool places uh, very easily, and um, so it was great for going to gigs and things like that as well. And then back to uh, Lightwell Valley, so I did five years there altogether and uh, managed to survive despite the lack of total lack of health and safety. <laughs> Uh, and speaking of health and safety, I also uh, went and worked on a mushroom farm after that for um, a, a few months in the in the winter. Uh, and this was nice because the sheds were nice and warm uh, in the winter, uh, growing these mushrooms. So we'd kind of wrap these, we'd make these bags of mushrooms. So they had uh, chicken and horse fertilizer in them when we have to kind of bounce them so they'd all, they'd all fit onto the shelves. And then we'd leave them overnight to, uh, to start, start cooking and and then go in the next day and put all the seeds and the topsoil on but there was one time where the the shed went somebody put the, sh the heat on too much and it had just generated huge amounts of carbon dioxide unfortunately that's not uh, visible so we didn't know and there weren't any monitors of carbon dioxide levels in there so we all end up coming out after about half an hour just like being very uh, giddy and wobbly and off balance um, so again another i managed to survive that experience um, they also made me drive a forklift truck without any tr training and I ended up getting that stuck at one point so they had to get a tractor to pull it out. Um, yes, yeah, so that was an adventure. So uh, pretty much after I got that stuck, I think the day after I actually left, um, I had a job at an electronics factory and that was really fun because I actually started learning about uh, interesting things like just-in-time manufacturing and Kanban. Um, so I was actually the tester uh, at the end of a production line and if I found any issues, I could go back and actually stop the production and get them to change things, 
which is really important when they start putting all the capacitors in the wrong way around and I switch the power, power supplies on and they, the capacitors blow up in my face. That's a bit uh, unpleasant. Um, luckily I didn't uh, electrocute myself, I didn't get anything uh, nasty in my face, it's just this big waft of smoke that comes blasting at you. They actually smell quite nice, some of them, uh, but I'm not quite sure what they contain, hopefully nothing too toxic. Uh, but it was great to kind of be interactive uh, with that and kind of learn how you can kind of affect the workflow very easily and uh, and uh, yeah, get an efficient process going as well. Um, but the real thing I learned about there that was really useful was uh, getting into uh, uh, computing. So I'd, I've been doing some hacking on computers at home, but this is the first time I got paid for it. Uh, and this is back in 1993. Oh my God, that's a long time ago. Uh, and we had these Acorn computers which have ARM chips, which are the same chips you get in your mobile phones, but I'm pretty sure these were a lot less powerful than what you get in your mobile phone these days. Uh, but I get to do some Pascal and basically doing some soak testing of these power supplies. We do run all sorts of tests. And so we just had to write a whole bunch of code to make them work and make sure they weren't going to blow up in the faces of our customers, which is quite important. Uh, and I enjoyed that so much then I went to university again, this time in Newcastle, to do software engineering and uh, yeah, I often went uh, ganning down the tune for a study uh, and learnt a bit of Geordie, which is what this is. Uh, and the study is this huge great big uh, sandwich, like, it's, they don't do small sandwiches in Newcastle, they do absolutely huge sandwiches uh, with huge fillings. And they're very tasty and they're very useful when you're staying up at night studying. Um, you've got lots of energy to uh, to do that as well. But it was a really nice place. Uh, I enjoyed it there and I learnt, this is me on the computer, hacking away. Um, learnt lots of different languages, got into open source and especially Linux. Even though like the first time I installed Linux operating system, I, I had to do it using 83 floppy disks. And the 79th floppy disk I found to be broken uh, and so I had to start all over again after I created a new one. Uh, luckily, Linux is a lot easier to install these days. Uh, but I managed to survive that course and I actually got a, a, an honours degree. And through one of my lecturers, I got um, a job in the Netherlands. And just packed up all my stuff and got the ferry and drove over there. And I can speak a little bit of Dutch, ik spreek een klein beetje Netherlands, thank you, Phil. Uh, but conversationally, I probably kind of suck now, um, but I might be able to pick it up again. Uh, but it was quite, I didn't really think about uh, the implications of driving in the Netherlands in a UK van because the steering wheel's on the wrong side now, and you've got all these trams in the way, and you've got bicycles on the other side as well. So I was a little bit concerned about running people over, but luckily uh, I was uh, being an ultra safe driver there and uh, managed to survive without uh, any problems. And Amsterdam was a beautiful place there. I, I kind of loved the three years that I worked there and lots of places to explore. Uh, lots of tourists there as well, um, but you soon find places the, where the tourists don't go, especially the drunken English ones. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I, I worked in this tiny little uh, consultancy. Um, some people call it boutique, but it was just small. I think there was, yeah, there was literally three I was the third technical person to join, so it was like, it was tiny. Uh, and they used to do this new but um, proven technology, that was their tagline. Uh, but we do things like UML and Corba and object-oriented databases, things that nobody uses anymore except for Java. Uh, so I, I did a lot of Java there, that was good. I also got into training as well, so that was quite nice to be able to kind of grow those skills um, and uh, yeah, a lot of training was kind of done on the fly. So they just say, oh, you need to go train somebody next week. Ah, oh, I better write the actual training material then uh, at the weekends. So it's quite intense, uh, but I learned an awful lot. I, we considered like um, this consultancy as like dog years. You'd kind of learn like three times as much uh, as, you, um, in the, as you would normally if you were working in any other job. Uh, one of the nice things about uh, Amsterdam was I discovered falafels. I love falafels now. Oh. Especially when you go to uh, the little kiosks that you allow you to top up uh, food as well. So you get your you get your falafel, and then you can just add more and more uh, f um, food on top of it, toppings. And they had these really spicy uh, carrots that were absolutely delicious. Uh, they kind of blow your mind, but um, so so nice. And I think that's got me got me into spicy food uh, really well. 
and then I moved back to uh, London, which was uh, uh, nice to come back to the UK and uh, where I could more or less understand the language. Um, and doing a lot of Java uh, there as well, and do some more training. Uh, and working for a whole bunch of little, little consultancy companies and then slightly bigger ones and then consultancy companies that got acquired by other really big companies and we eventually got acquired by Dimension Data uh, and got a, a nice little redundancy payout so I decided to go off, branch off on my own, do some do some my own consultancy work uh, which initially started off as like teaching people how to do content and document management and then ended up teaching devs that they should really use version control um, and this was back in uh, 2001 uh, when it wasn't as just prevalent as it, as it is now. Um, so that was good fun. And then I joined a startup, which uh, was really exciting. My first time, just me and one other person that had like this business idea of building this intelligent accounting system. And they wanted to sell it to the, the inline revenue. And uh, it was, which is like the UK department that deals with all your taxes. And they loved the idea, but unfortunately, they didn't want to give us any money, which is kind of a bit of a uh, a bit of a problem for a startup. And uh, we didn't get any funding or anything, uh, so it kind of all ended up uh, fizzling out, unfortunately. Um, but so I took a career break and started cycling again. And uh, I it was I got a job as a cycle courier around London, which sounds quite dangerous, but it actually wasn't too bad. Um, uh, you just need to be aware of traffic around and actually most drivers in London are, are okay it's just a handful that are you have to look out for but I did learn a lot more about London I've, I'd only been in London for about uh, three three four years and uh, it was a good way to kind of discover London and, and it made the it made everything seem a lot closer than it uh, than I thought it was uh, no longer needing to ride on the tube everywhere and uh, discovered lots of shortcuts. And I was riding about 60, 60 miles, 100, 100K every day, uh, because if, if you rode anything less, you, you didn't get as much money. Uh, and essentially it was, the job was basically, um, yeah, solving the traveling salesman problem uh, every day, because you got paid a very small amount for each package. So you had to carry about like 10, 12 packages with you all the time and then continually picking up and dropping off packages uh, within a certain amount of time. So you had to kind of work out the, the route, the most optimum route, every time you were given a new instruction to pick up a parcel. Uh, yeah, so it was a really good visual challenge. And yeah, by the end of it, I think after the first couple of months, I was no longer looking up uh, my A to Z because there was no Google Maps there um, to help me. And even even if I had Google Maps, I still don't think it would be easy enough. It'd probably take me longer to try and figure it out on Google Maps than actually just uh, figure it out in my head. But you kind of, I could still, nowadays, there's still plenty of routes I can just picture in my head. I've got the map there. I don't need to know. I don't need to look anything up and uh, just get around London quite nicely. And I did a whole bunch of other companies as well. And most, a lot of companies I've worked for got acquired. Um, I don't know if it says anything about the companies I'm currently working for, I'm sure. Uh, some companies also acquired uh, other companies I work for as well. There's always interesting things happening uh, in companies I've worked for. Uh, and then I worked for a city bank as well, which, which is quite nice. They pay me lots of money, but then I had about eight different jobs to do all at the same time, which was uh, quite intense. Um, but uh, yeah, certainly got some interesting experiences of the uh, financial world in there. Um, and all the while, when I was back in London, I started doing a lot more work for the community. So I got involved with the London Java community, uh, running events for them, and uh, yeah, trying to get people to like share their experiences and doing talks and so on. Uh, we also did things for the graduate developer community, so reaching out to university students and recent graduates and helping them kind of develop the skills that they needed to get jobs. Because universities are really interesting and you learn lots of stuff, but they don't always teach you the really practical things that uh, you need to do a job, like version control, writing unit tests, and those kind of things. So we were trying to fill in the gaps for the students there. And uh, I also kind of was starting to get a little bit um, bored with Java after, um, 
I don't know, I, after about 10 years or so, so 10, 15 years of doing Java, I wanted to try doing some functional programming. So I started doing, I helped start the London Scala user group, uh, running some coding dojos, which are these really fun little evening events um, where you get together and try and solve a coding problem together. Uh, and there's usually lots of uh, unhealthy pizza there as well. And uh, But I'd never run a coding dojo event, so I had to try and figure out how to do that. So I went to the London Closure community uh, started going to their events and just stealing all their secrets, uh, which worked really well. And um, But then after about six months, I realized I actually preferred Clojure to Scala. Uh, it's a much simpler, elegant language. So I started doing a lot more work for the Clojure community. And one of the things we did was Clojure Bridge, was, which is helping reach out to underrepresented groups in uh, in the industry and helping them start to code uh, or start to uh, use Clojure. And so we had a few hundred people uh, across like about 12 different events uh, and teaching them how to get into coding. Uh, so that was quite rewarding too. Uh, and then I also run a Hack the Tower, which is this uh, hack day I did for about five years, once a month. Uh, we just get on, on a Saturday when I was working at Salesforce, the Salesforce offices were empty. So originally we were in this uh, tower with the little um, red uh, poppy on the top. And then we moved into a much bigger, this square tower, and we had a whole floor to ourselves and lots of big meeting rooms. Uh, and so I, I think for about four or five years, I was teaching people, I was like running a closure workshop all day, just me and whoever turned up. Uh, and it was great, good fun. I actually learned a whole bunch of stuff and I think other people learned stuff there as well. Uh, and we even had a few robots to play with as well. Uh, and luckily, like Salesforce did give us a budget, so I, I went to Tesco's and bought like two massive, great big shopping bags worth of uh, food and sandwiches to feed everybody at lunchtime as well. Uh, so that was good fun. And a lot of that kind of led up to me doing Practically, which is my online um, educational stuff for Clojure. So there's like about 100 hours of video on YouTube of me trying to code, um, mostly successfully. Uh, so if you ever wanted to. Uh, Learn closure. That's an, uh, that's one way to do that. Or if you just can't sleep at night, that's another way to do that as well. Um, and companies also pay me to do this kind of thing as well. So as well as doing development for them, uh, I also helped people learn to love Jira, which apparently not everybody does, but hopefully they do a little bit more now. Uh, and this is before Jira was online, so we used to teach people how to set it up and install it and configure it so that their users wouldn't hate them. Uh, and we'd go to conferences uh, and spread the word uh, and occasionally have a little sleep. These Atlassian, um, uh, the Atlassian uh, sleeping bags are really handy at, towards the end of the day to have a little bit of a rest on two. And it wasn't all hard work, there was a bit of fun. Um, uh, we got to go to Sydney, Australia, which is uh, where the headquarters of Atlassian is. And uh, that was absolutely beautiful and stunning. I think when we when we when we arrived there, I think we all decided that we wanted to emigrate to uh, to Sydney, Australia, uh, because it's just so beautiful. Uh, and I've got like thousands of pictures, which I'm not going to show you right now, um, of uh, Sydney, Australia. Uh, and yeah, I still I still love their place. And I also worked for uh, Salesforce as well. And so we did a little conference called Dreamforce, which had about 170,000 attendees. Um, but we only had about 13,000 coming to the developer area, um, which wasn't too bad. Uh, but so I've helped organize some of those big tech conferences as well. Uh, well, this actually, this picture is just the main road between the three huge, great big conference centers. Uh, it's like the Moscone Conference Center in San Francisco. And uh, they actually closed the main road. And this is kind of just at the breakout space. Uh, <laughs> The actual thing is just immensely massive it, it, and they still don't fit it all in here there's still place they, they hire up a whole bunch of meeting rooms in hotels around the place as well uh, the, the the actual event is insane in terms of size um but yeah uh we i do that once a year um and then we'd also do the same events uh, in europe um so in amsterdam and uh, several places in germany and in the uk and, and in france as well uh, so yeah it was uh Busy, crazy days, but it, it was fun, exciting, and very exhausting. And if people still didn't sign up at the end, we had different ways of uh, getting them to engage with Salesforce. Um, 
during that, uh, yeah, I'm just going to go through this quickly. So I bought a house with a nice view. Eventually, once they built all the houses around us, they didn't tell us they were still building everything around me. So it was a bit noisy for the first couple of months, but now it's nice and peaceful. I adopted two rescue cats and they're really cute and funny to play with and occasionally they're a bit savage uh, but most of the time they're nice to me and occasionally they'll pair with me and occasionally they'll sit on my desk and stare at me I'll just sleep uh, and luckily I've got a split keyboard for this purpose so that I can actually keep on working uh, when the cats want some attention or just want to use me as a bed um, and then finally uh, I decided to do something a little bit crazy um, uh, I decided to cycle across Britain from the pointy bit at the bottom to the pointy bit at the top and you can see from the relief map along the side that it's quite bumpy along the way and uh, I basically rode this in nine days which is like actually it's 110 miles a day on average uh, but it was absolutely beautiful uh, if even when you were climbing up lots of big hills I think the equivalent of cycling up Mount Everest more than twice if you're going to picture how, how many hills I went up um, and obviously you get to go, them, go down on them as well and uh, yeah this is just one of the smaller hills this is Cheddar Gorge uh, you might recognize this if, in, if you're in the Bath and Bristol area um, that was one of the most one of the more picturesque ones to cycle up occasionally it was a bit wet um, but uh, if you got the right gear on it's not too bad it still kept warm but uh, yeah we only had a couple of wet days we had every day was early, an early day though we, we were getting up around uh, half five six o'clock and leaving by about seven every day uh, after a nice breakfast and uh, and then getting back uh, and sleeping in some lovely tents um, and so the first night I thought this is going to be horrible because like people were snoring and there was lots of noise but after the first couple of days you're so tired you don't even hear anything as soon as you hit the floor you're asleep um, no you didn't have to carry a tent luckily uh, they did set the tents up for you uh, and there was catering and, and things like that there uh, um, for you and uh, uh, but yeah so you basically just got up uh, you, ha you had like a um, a big rucksack you could take with you as well and uh and sleep it with the sleeping bag but uh yeah that the the tents were all set up for you as well so like you're the last thing you want to do is ride for like nine ten hours and then have to set your own tent up that would be that would be quite cruel and unusual punishment so they did they did that for you um uh but it was absolutely stunning scenery um and that kept me going uh because i really didn't think i'd actually make it uh, and then I got halfway there when being over lots of hump, uh, lots of bumps and there's still even more bumps to go but I think by the time I got to the halfway my, I was starting to feel like I was actually I might just about do this um, even though the glue in my shoe had started to come off um, I think I, I tried to dry them out too close to the heater uh, so I had to uh, wrap gaffer tape around my shoe just to keep it on <laughs> I think little things like that just kept me uh, kept me sane and kept me focused on just pedaling uh, uh, on and on every day. Uh, and of course, like yeah, just cycling through some wonderful little places, especially in Scotland, an absolutely beautiful place. Even the the great big massive hills were kind of stunning to to look at, and uh, and going down the hills as well was really good fun. Uh, and it, like taking pictures of the scenery, this is like the tiniest like, little um, castle I've ever seen, especially a house with pork cutlets on which is uh, hilarious um, uh, and yeah once you get to the top of the hill like you take a little picture to keep yourself boosted if you actually look at my eyes you can see the massive bags under my eyes I think this is from the seventh day uh, of the event so I still got two more to do uh, and I was I was quite tired but I was I was enjoying it um, or at least that was what I was telling myself especially when we come to like the really big hills and you might be able to see like the tiny little dots on the road those are cyclists going up this really big hill i think this is on the eighth day is one of the big hills um but it's such, such rewarding to actually get to the top uh and i managed to cycle up all the hills without having to get off my bike so that was a that was a real kind of achievement for me um and yeah lots of scenery to do and then it's the last day uh, going across the top of Scotland which was quite fun because once you got to the coast it's incredibly windy and we were like experiencing 50 mile an hour winds 
and sometimes it's like side winds as well so it kind of blows you off and you go um, but luckily I didn't get blown off completely and eventually made it to Land's End uh, uh, John O'Groats and was kind of relieved but I don't think it really sank in that I'd actually done it for like three four weeks afterwards it, you're kind of in this bubble while you're doing it and you've just got to do the next day and the next day and then when it's over you kind of think well you're tired for like a few days uh, and you're still buzzing but I think after a few days, I, after a few weeks, I kind of, oh yeah, I did do, I did do that. And I kind of look at my medal and think, oh yeah, I managed to do that, amazing. Um, but then it was back to reality and I got a job at Statsbomb. Statsbomb, Statsbomb, you're my Statsbomb. Um, I did sing that in the interview, which I think might have got me the job, maybe, I'm not sure, I'd have to talk to Tom about that. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm working on the data team, trying to improve how we provide data to our customers. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's great. I, I mean, this is one of the most fun uh, places I've worked at for uh, for for ages. So it's uh, thank you all for that. The only thing that wasn't fun was I managed to get COVID, uh, pretty much like in the first couple of weeks of starting here. So I've had and I've had it ever since. I think I'm free of it now. Uh, and I'd just like to thank Vicky and, and Gray for all the help and support they've given me uh, to go through this as well as well as everybody else in the team. Um, so I'm ready to get back on my bike and do lots of more riding and hopefully ride across Britain uh, next year and if you want to follow my cycling activities then you can find me on Strava. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Good, thank you. Thank you. It was a bit longer than I expected but... There you go.